All right, well, good evening, folks. How's it going? I'm gonna make the official introduction here because we're just kicking off. We've been working away a little bit throughout the day and night getting prepped for this event. Um, but I would like to now introduce and welcome everybody and those of us online as well that are tuning in right now to our 2300 Degrees event. And we have our visiting artist, Megan Stelges with us. I say we give Megan a nice round of applause. She's got a really, really beautiful piece planned out. Um, we've been working with Megan in the Hot Shop here in the Amphitheater Hot Shop for the last few days. We've got our core team, G. Brian Juck, has given Megan a hand right now. We have Catherine Ayers over here. Uh, my name's Chris. I'll be narrating for this first portion. Jeff Max going to jump in. And Connor, is it? And Connor McClellan is also here with Megan. Um, so we are all going to join together, um, put a group effort together to create a beautiful piece. So the theme for tonight is uh, Finger Lakes Wine and Cideries. So we're actually going to be creating a barrel out of glass, a blown glass barrel. And we're going to adorn it with these grape leaves and some grape clusters. So Megan has actually created a bunch of grapes and a bunch of these leaves already. We have them resting in our garage over on this side. We have a few furnaces here that we're going to work out of. Um, and she is finishing up a couple leaves right now. So throughout the process, there's going to be a lot that's happening. You're going to see a lot go into this demonstration as we move through it. And we also have Amanda. She is on our social media channel. So if anybody's out there online watching, you have any questions, you have any comments, you're dying to know something that we're not covering in our narration, you can certainly get in touch with her, and she will field those questions to us. But in our amphitheater hot shop here, we also have um, wonderful AV support. We have cameras all around us, and our camera guy down here is going to get some nice close-up shots. So always take a look up those monitors, those of you that are here, and you see some really good imagery. Um, but this leaf, this is solid sculpted glass. And one thing that Megan uh, really, really is good at is creating this organic effect with these components. And we have a lot of ways we can apply color as we work this material. And an excellent way to get this organic, excuse me, organic effect is to use color powder. Um, and you'll see her using some of that powder. I'll talk about it when we get over there. Um, but she has this adventuring green powder um, in these little gathers of glass. And it's a very sparkly color, that adventuring. It's like glitter in the actual color. And we will be using color bar as well. But quite a bit of powder is used in what Megan is working with. And you can actually see some of the work that she's created. Now there's some watermelon slices that are resting in an oven. We made some yesterday and today, so they're too hot to look at. Um, but you can see the effect, that watermelon pattern that she did on here. This is more that adventuring, that sort of glittery color. Um, these bananas and the grouping of bananas. It's a really interesting piece. Uh, so the story goes with this is that there's an Australian brand of bananas that's an organic brand. And apparently they dip the tips of the bananas into wax. And so that's what she is created here. Now, another good point to mention here is that Megan is one of the New Glass Now artists. So she has a piece of glass that will be in the exhibit, New Glass Now. It's not opened yet, but it's opening this year. Um, there's many artists in there, and Megan is one of them. So she's here as a visiting artist with our team for this week as a, a little residency. So during sculpture, it's really useful to have these hot torches. You can see her dialing the temperature of that torch up or down, depending on the level of detail that she's after. But that's an oxygen gas torch. And here's where she's actually using a little rod of glass. It's called cane. This is just a scrap. It's a tool that she made, just this little rod. And heating up the very edge of that leaf and using that rod to stick to the edge and then pull those points, so getting those really fine details by doing so. Well, she was using a tag, a tiny little spatula tool to carve in those grooves to create the leaf texture. And in between all these moves, it's very important that we keep everything hot enough so nothing cracks. That's one very important thing when we work glass, is to never let anything get too cold on us. And cold's a relative term. Uh, when we say cold glass, we mean totally rigid glass, rock solid. And for our glass, that's around 1,000 degrees. Now, if it drops below 900 too quickly, that's when it can crack or shatter. So G, who's holding on to the punty, the rod right now, you'll see in between a series of moves, he goes into our reheating furnace. Now, this is just an empty oven. There's absolutely nothing inside this, including the camera. The camera that gives us all this wonderful view is safely behind it. It looks through a pretty small window of fused silica glass. That's a specialty glass with a really high melting point. That oven is running at about 2100 Fahrenheit right now. But when he goes in for those very brief reheats, we call that a flash heat. 
and it's really just to ensure that everything stays above that critical temperature. So there's a lot of experience on the team that we have out here. Megan's been blowing glass for I believe close to 13, 14 years, she mentioned. G's been at it for 20 years. Jeff's been at it for about 26 years, 25 years. Catherine's been at it for about 17, 18 years, so a lot of skill here on the team. So you're going to see quite a bit happening. So Megan's going to continue to work on these leaves. I think we have about seven or eight of them already made. She's going to continue to work on those. And Jeff is now starting up what will become the barrel, the wine barrel. How many leaves she's planning on doing? I'm going to guess maybe 15 to 20. Yeah, I think we have about eight leaves made already. So right around there. So Jeff, you guys are using color bar. What color do you have? Is that brown, I'm assuming? It is a brown, an opal brown, wood, <laughs> wood brown. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that we can apply color. I mentioned the powder that Megan is using. But if you look right here, and this, is, this might actually be close to what they have, uh, this is color rot, color bar. And we purchased most of the stuff that we use from a factory over in Germany called the Reichenbach Company. And so we can actually just chop off whatever size piece of color bar that we need. And it depends on how large the piece is going to be. So the bubble that Jeff is creating, it's all clear glass. He's dipped into our furnace and collected some clear. And we're going to drip that brown glass right onto this clear bubble and case that bubble with it. And when we do this, we're actually going to uh, create a brown bubble of glass. So maybe we are going to get some music piped in to our amphitheater here. So you can see two different workstations set up here, and we have two different size reheating furnaces. We actually have a very large reheating furnace that uh, we use on special occasions if the work demands it. But that one takes quite a bit of time, a lot more energy to heat up and maintain its heat to work out of. But the one that Jeff has over here is a little bit smaller than the one, the main furnace. But Connor's heating up that chunk of brown color bar. And of course, everything looks bright orange when it's this hot working close to 2,000 degrees. It's radiating quite a bit of light. But this is called an overlay. So we're going to drip that little bit of brown onto this clear bubble. And at this point, that bubble is totally rigid. It's stable enough to support this fresh gather dropped onto it. And Jeff will now go through a series of moves to really peel that color over that clear bubble entirely. And once he has that overlay complete, once he has a brown bubble of glass, You'll see him dip back into our furnace. This is our main oven up here. This melting oven has a ceramic crucible inside of it. And this one will hold 1,000 pounds of glass if we top it right off to the brim. We filled it right up on Sunday night in preparation for this week. And there's probably still seven or 800 pounds of glass in there. We haven't really used that much of it. But at 2,100 Fahrenheit, and I'll talk a little bit more about it when Jeff goes to gather more glass, uh, the glass has the same consistency as table honey, so room temperature table honey. This flame working is very, very tricky stuff. When she's heating up the edge of that leaf, if she overheats it, it starts to soften and sort of bead back on itself. It'll start to thicken and she'll lose some of that detail. Uh, but if you don't get hot enough, then it doesn't move the way you need it to. So it's a pretty fine line, especially the thinner and more delicate you get, all these little points. And the glass will lose its workability rapidly as it gets thinned out like that as well. But the connection to this rod, this is called a punty, and that connection, that contact, 
is based mostly on how hot you keep it. So when G goes to reheat that whole leaf, he's making sure to give a little bit of heat to that punty. And also being very delicate when you move around with it. If you set that rod down too hard, that vibration can cause that leaf to drop right off at the floor. So we are gonna transfer that leaf. She's done with all the points. We're gonna transfer it to another punty, another handle. That's what G's gonna form. And once we transfer this, she can then heat up the other side, the bottom side of the leaf, and she'll make a couple cuts just to finish it off. But there she's crimping down that connection to make sure this will break free with no trouble. So we had a question online, where did Megan get her start in glass blowing? She's originally from Kansas, and she went to Emporia State. Is it Emporia State? Yep, so she studied glass there. She also worked with a wonderful artist, Karen Willenbrink Johnson, who was very, very good and gifted at sculpting glass. Um, and it's definitely evident to watch Megan work that she's been trained with some of the best. Um, but Megan and Connor both live now uh, very close to Seattle. They actually have their own studio called Gray Barn Studio. So that's where they reside now, out on the West Coast. What is it, graybarn.com? Graybarnstudios.com. Cold, cold cuts glass.com, Connor says. Check those out. That's our cold shop. That's the cold shop. Now you can see if you watch closely, and with great AV support, this is really nice to be able to see. Cutting through the glass, you can actually see it lose its heat rapidly. Those metal shears and any metal tool draws temperature quickly from the glass. So Jeff's got that initial gather over that overlay. And if we want a decent sized barrel, it will probably gather multiple times. There is a limit to how much we can get out of the furnace at one time because of that consistency. And it doesn't look like it would drip right to the floor when he comes out of the furnace because he's turning so smoothly and evenly. But that's a lot of skill to get to that point. It really does want to just flow to the floor. If you were to stop turning, it certainly would. So once she's done with this leaf, we're gonna see it go into our garage, which is on the far side of our stage here. And this is just an oven that keeps glass at the right temperature until we're ready to pull it out and attach it to the piece. Just like you can park a car in a garage at home, we can park glass in ours. So G has a paddle just a big metal paddle, and that's actually been preheated. If you were to put this 1,000 degree leaf onto a cold metal paddle, it could actually crack the leaf. So that paddle has been resting in the garage, which is just about 1,000 degrees. And away it goes. And I like that little bend you put to him there at the end. That's nice, good detail. So what Jeff's doing, he's got a tool called a block, and these come in a variety of sizes. Most of these are made from cherry wood, but fruit woods are great for shaping molten glass, as long as the wood is saturated in water, it's not treated, it's just tap water. Uh, but those fruit wood scoops were able to center the gathers of glass on the blowpipe. And that's a similar method to how a ceramics artist works pottery, right? When the potter's wheel spins, they have a slab of clay, they have to center it first with their hands. We can't use our hands, right? Without burning ourselves severely, but we have all these tools to help us out. So he centered that gather around that core bubble talking a little bit more about the glass itself. It's made of mostly silica sand. Soda ash and limestone are the other primary ingredients that makes soda lime glass. Now colors are formed, you melt down different metal oxides or metal chlorides with those ingredients. So I talked a little bit about that company, Reichenbach, and they have a couple hundred or close to a couple hundred colors that we can work with nowadays. So they have their own batch recipes they mix up all those ingredients and melt down different metal oxides or chlorides, changing the color. So Jeff's now got his second gather over top of the bubble. And each time he comes out of that furnace, he likes to go to this unit called a pipe cooler. So the stainless steel that we work with, is not a great conductor of heat. It's what allows us to hold on to usually half 
two thirds of the pipe as we're working. Um, but dipping into a furnace like that, or when you're in an oven for a really long time, taking a long heat, the heat does transfer up a little bit higher and higher so we can use that pipe cooler, make our lives more comfortable. So Megan's already applied some of that adventuring green powder onto that small gather, shaping this up. And I really like this next part where she creates the, the flattened profile of the leaf. She'll get that little gather really, really hot, and she'll actually just cut it right off onto a ceramic shelf that's on our marbling table. And instantly, you're gonna see G take a wet board and just smush that bit really, really hard. He's gonna flatten it. And the hotter you get the glass before you do this, the flatter, the thinner of a profile you can create with it. Oh, okay, gotcha. So it just needs a little bit more glass first. You co uh, color that again after you do that too? Yeah. So here we can see Jeff using a very common tool in Glass Studio. This is layers and layers of wet newspaper. I mentioned how ceramics artists shape with their hands really well, and we can't, but this gets us very, very close to that same effect. And you do have to use this tool wet. Just sprinkle a little bit of water on there. Local water. How many gathers on that, Jeff? Oh, so he's got a caliper all set, nice. So maybe another couple gathers on there. Before we start to go too far with this barrel, before we start to inflate it too much, Jeff needs to make sure he has all the glass he wants. If you start to blow this bubble up larger and it gets thinner, you get to a point where you actually can't go back into the furnace or comfortably cannot go back into the furnace and gather more. So you wanna do it while the bubble is still really thick and able to support those fresh gathers. And each time you gather on a bubble, you're getting more and more material because you're dipping on a larger surface area. So there's a good close-up shot of that powder. That's actually a powder booth too that we're using right now. So we've got the green powder in a tray, but it's sitting inside a powder booth that has a vacuum system, um, a HEPA filter. So all that powder, that dust from the glass is pretty hazardous if it gets airborne and you breathe it. So we use that powder booth and it just sucks up any of the hazardous material that's coming up from the pan there as she rolls through. And a lot of times you'll see gaffers strip gather like that. If you don't want or need all that material just that once when you come out of the furnace, you can let it run right off into a bucket like that. It's just a bucket of water. And that's all clear glass. It's totally recyclable. So we'll melt that back down later on. That water actually just starts to shatter that glass when it hits it. We'll break it up into fine chunks called cullet. And it melts down very easily. So in between these gathers, Jeff is also very conscious to make sure the bubble he has drops to the right temperature where it's stable enough to support that gather. If you dip into the oven too soon, the bubble's too hot or too soft, it starts to get off center or it can collapse on you. You can lose the bubble integrity. Worst case scenario, some glass could actually drip right back off into the furnace. But making sure the temperatures are right. All right, so here she goes with the next leaf. Cuts off a little nub. Here you go. 
and G has instantly flattened it with that wet paddle. Catherine's made a punty for it, just that hot little gatherer glass and that solid rod. And you're going to see a lot of this going on, a lot of transfers with all these pieces back and forth. And so we have a drawing here. This is a sketchbook of magazine, I believe. You guys can actually see. So that's the type of barrel that we're going for here, that old style wooden barrel. And I think she's going to sort of um, create these detailed lines by carving it. And then you're going to powder it too to do that. OK, sweet. So we're going to use some more powder to create that effect. But then the straps for the barrel, this is actually going to be a lot of fun. We're going to take um, different colored bits and we're going to wrap them around the barrel once we get to that point. And that's always a crowd-pleasing moment when you watch the way the glass loves to just stretch and wrap around a form. And I think once the barrel's complete, that's when we'll start to pull those leaves out, pull the grapes out one by one, attach them to the barrel. And I'm pretty sure that in her head she's already got this configured. You want to start off with a plan before you begin. Get the team on the same page. Everything goes much smoother that way. So I think that's Jeff's final gather. Four nice gathers on there. Now, if we wanted to make a really large barrel, we certainly have the shop um, to do so, but we would want a larger blowpipe. So the pipe that he's on right now is kind of a standard large scale pipe, but we have pipes that are double the diameter, double the wall thickness, much more sturdy to support bigger gathers than that. We had, we had a question online about the marver. So this is our marvering table, this big metal slab. And this is a rather large marvering table. Most studios are going to have a smaller one than this. Um, but the question was in regards to the thickness of the metal. And is that because you're putting a lot of heavy or a lot of hot objects on there, is that to displace the heat better? And absolutely, yes. Um, so if we were working on a really large scale piece, we might be rolling the glass back and forth on this metal quite a bit quite frequently, and that metal, the more metal you have, the more it does pull the heat. And we use the metal as a heat sink at times. Not so much right now, and we might, might use it for this gather at some point, but if we want to chill certain areas of the glass, we can use different tools to do that. And the metal is a wonderful heat sink. It really pulls temperature out of the glass rapidly, and so we can use those tables for that purpose. As of, oh, so how long is that marbling table? If you take proper care of that, it's going to last forever. Absolutely. Yeah, we try to keep it pretty clean. You know, you don't want it to rust and corrode and whatnot. Um, an interesting point about that, we used to be partnered up with Celebrity Cruise Lines. When I say we, the Corning Museum of Glass, we had a um, partnership with Celebrity Cruise Lines, and we had three shops, all electric studios, installed on the top deck of three of Celebrity's Solstice class vessels. And out there, if anybody sailed, you know, the salty air, the salt water really affects the tools, the metal tools, the metal equipment. Um, well, we had specialty design marvers by a company called Spiral Arts out on the West Coast. They actually built this entire shop that we're using right now. But they used naval bronze for the marvers. Um, so it was a wonderful little addition. It looked pretty fancy. It looked kind of like we had gold on the, on the stage. Um, but the naval bronze weathered the conditions much, much better than a steel marver out there. We had a steel marver at one point. I think we had to grind the top down almost once a week, get rid of all that rust. But yeah, marver is good for life as long as you take care of it. So Jeff and Connor over here working together, using a lot of teamwork. Connor is taking the, the reheats for Jeff now. And we're starting to inflate this bubble. This is where things get really exciting. This bubble of glass is very, very hot, letting it hang towards the ground a little bit, utilizing gravity to stretch the bubble, simultaneously introducing a constriction that we call a jack line. This is named after the tool that Jeff is using right now. They're called jacks. And these are steel blades that aren't very sharp. I say blade, they're basically like a butter knife, um, but welded to this sprung steel handle. And there's a lot of ways to use this tool, but that's their primary function, is to squeeze down into the glass and create a constriction. 
So there's going to be a time when we need to remove that bubble from this blowpipe, and to do so, we'll break it free. Now, we don't want to damage the integrity of the bubble. We don't want to crack it or take a chunk out of it. So if we have a clean line to break it free at, then we're in good shape. And that's why you'll see him concentrate and reiterate that jack line with that tool. And Jeff actually preheated those jacks. They work best when they've been heated and have some wax applied to them as a lubrication. So I mentioned how the metal is a good heat sink. Sometimes we intentionally chill areas of the glass, but if you use cold jacks, it gives you half the amount of time to squeeze that line in because you have to heat the tool up with the glass. But Jeff heated them with that torch beforehand. It just helps them out. And this is where I love to talk about this. When we're heating in the oven, people ask us, how long do you, or how do you know how long to stay in the oven? How do you know when the glass is ready? And as you heat it longer and longer, it's getting hotter and hotter. Gravity's pull feels greater on the material because it's turning more into a liquid, right? It's the viscosity is changing. We have to compensate for that by applying a significant amount more torque with our hands, our forearms, and our wrists. So if you watch as he heats in the oven, you might notice that when he first goes in, it's not as hot and he's turning a little bit easier. And the longer he's in there, the more his body starts to activate. And in this case, using that torch to spot heat the back end of that bubble. If he wants that back section to inflate a little bit more than it was, he can kick the temperature up a little bit with that propane torch. But here, making use of that newspaper pad just to kind of stop the bubble from blowing out in certain areas. We can shape the newspaper and we can stop the bubble from blowing out by holding the paper there on the bubble. So the series of reheating that, or excuse me, series of torching that backside and then going into the oven and torching again and going back and forth, that's basically to kind of kick the heat back into that one section because every time you go into that furnace and come out, the first part of the bubble in is the tip and the last part out is the tip. So that is inevitably getting hotter than the rest. Also the pipe, the metal pipe that we're on is pulling heat from the glass. So that section always loses heat faster than the tip of the bubble. So using that torch just to keep that balance. And working larger scale like this, it is common to have a couple people taking turns on the blowpipe. Also to wear some extra protective gear. If you look at Jeff's right arm, you can see he's wearing a couple sleeves. One, I believe, is just cotton, but he's got a Kevlar sleeve underneath, which is a really good insulated material, shielding the inner part of his forearm from all that radiant heat. If you see the glass moving at all, stretching or inflating or bending, it's well above 1,000 degrees. In fact, it's closer to 1,500, maybe even 1,800 Fahrenheit. And so we've got a caliper all set for the dimensions of this barrel. I think he has one for the length and one for the width. This is what we're shooting for. And the larger that gets inflated, the thinner that bubble starts to get. Now, I talked a little bit about this with the sculptural elements that we see uh, Megan working on. As the glass gets thinner and thinner, it loses heat faster. It will lose its workability faster. So we have to pay attention to that and adjust our rhythm. The reheats become a little more frequent, and the time at the bench shortens. So we had it. So 
So we had another question online come in about different types of glass. Is the glass that we're using different from the types of glass that flame workers use? Now, a lot of flame workers work with borosilicate glass. Some work with soft glass. So borosilicate, many people know of a brand of glass called Pyrex, and I'm sure that everybody in this room could probably shake their head and say, yes, I've heard of Pyrex. That is a brand name for a type of borosilicate, and that is a much harder glass than the soda lime we're working with. It has boron mixed in, and basically that just creates a lower thermal expansion in the material, which breaking that down a little further means that you can rapidly heat or rapidly cool, say, a casserole dish made from borosilicate, and it's not going to crack as easily as, say, soft glass. Um, the soda lime glass that we're working with is considered a soft glass, and it doesn't like that rapid temperature change. So it would be terrible to use our glass in the kitchen. But soda lime is a very common type of glass. Most windows, bottles, light bulbs, jars are made from a soda lime. That being said, there are so many formulations of soda lime. So our soda lime is engineered for our purposes, but if you were to take, um, say, bottles or light bulbs, a Coca-Cola bottle that's made from soda lime, it would be incompatible with our glass. So if you dumped in 50 bottles into our furnace, they would certainly melt at 2,000 degrees, and they would melt into that pot of glass. We could gather that out on a blowpipe or a rod and make something out of it, but when that glass started to cool, that incompatibility would cause that piece to crack. So it's got to be the right compatibility. Cap in the pipe? Sure. So each type of glass has what's called the coefficient of expansion, the COE. And that's basically how they measure how the glass will expand or contract as it's heated and cooled. And you have to have the right COE to mix glass. So the color that we're using, the Reichenbach, has the same COE as the soda lime glass that we're melting in our furnace. And that's why we can use it. So Jeff asked me to cap the back of the pipe. Catherine is actually pressing pretty hard on the very tip of that bubble. This is creating the bottom side of the barrel and capping air pressure in the bubble will stop that bottom from caving in, keeping the volume inside of that. So another leaf goes into the garage. That's what you have right here. That's the next size up though. Probably want that for a punny though. So it looks like Jeff has the bottom profile for the barrel. You're going to change it a little bit? You bet. So in each of these reheating furnaces, we have two burners. In our large oven that we're not using right now, we actually have four. Uh, but here we have natural gas piped right in, and each oven has a blower on there. So we're forcing air into those uh, flames, into those burners, and keeping the temperatures up. Now we can adjust the temperature if we want it. We can turn them up or down. We do have thermostat controllers on them. Uh, 2100 degrees is a pretty standard heat for working like this. But if we started to open up more doors, or say we're working something really, really thick, we might want a much higher temp. If we were working on something very delicate, we might turn it down. Actually, by the end of this process, we might drop the temperature down a little bit once we start to add those leaves and grapes so we can keep reheating everything uh, without losing some of the detail that Megan has sculpted into them. So once Jeff does get the bottom established on this barrel, we're going to transfer it over to another handle, another punty. And Connor's actually heating up one of our larger blowpipes. To get the glass to adhere to the metal, we do have to preheat the metal. And we have a pipe warmer over here, but we didn't have one of the larger pipes up that we wanted, so he's just preheating one of those right now. But these are essentially self-cleaning, too. So whenever we're done with a pipe or a rod and there's glass left on it, we put it into one of our dry bins or a water bucket if it's just a solid rod. And as the glass cools, it starts to crack and break itself right off. Do you need another cap on that, Jeff? Yeah. yeah. 
and it will turn. You got it. Yep. No problem. So Catherine's really focusing that heat just on that bottom two inches or so. But it's really important, again, to make sure that nothing gets too cold. And right, that's a relative term. But we have to take those series of deep reheats on everything we make. And learning the timing with that, the rhythm, and understanding the temperatures, that just comes with experience. It just takes a while to get that internal clock. But with the years and years of working the material, you start to develop that timing and that rhythm, and things get much easier. But that's something that beginners really struggle with. It takes a while to understand the heat, what you have to do with the glass to keep things running smooth. Does anybody in here have any questions about what the team's doing? This is a pretty exciting demonstration. It's going to get more exciting as we start to add everything. Um, but you can really see the use of the whole shop here with a team of glass blowers. But if you have any questions, just get your hand up in the air, get my attention. When you watch Megan cutting into this leaf, it's very easy to cut through the glass where it's that hot, where it's that soft. And that's why she's using that hot torch. She sort of marks where she wants to cut into the glass. Because if you tried to get everything hot enough to cut by heating in that oven, the whole thing would be flopping around. It would be really hard to get in there quickly and make that right cut. Um, but allowing most of that flat shape to stay almost entirely rigid, um, but superheating those one spots and then cutting into them. And it's a bit like cutting into a very thin strip of leather or cutting into an orange peel. We use that analogy quite a bit. Does not take a lot of pressure to cut through as long as it's hot. So just refining the bottom shape of this barrel too. Now every time you reheat the glass and soften it, any sharp or crisp edge starts to soften as well every time you reheat. Um, so getting a nice crisp line on the bottom, using that heat and then using uh, two different items, the newspaper pad and that board, squaring together, almost creating a mold for that barrel to ride in, getting that nice crisp edge. Now it looks like for this barrel, I'm going to guess that we are going to um, close this bubble off entirely at some point. So I just want to highlight what Jeff's doing right here. He has a tungsten pick. And this is a special material to use in a glass studio. It won't stick to the glass very, very well. You can actually superheat it and bore right through uh, the glass. And he's poking a hole right into the center of the bottom. Now this is going to be an air channel for later on. When we go to transfer this bubble, off this blowpipe, most likely, this is telling me that Jeff is gonna close off the opening that we're on right now. If you close off the opening on a glass bubble, what do you suppose happens if you go to reheat it? The air trapped inside expands and the piece will blow up. 
If it cools, it will actually cave in, collapse on itself. So we're creating an air path right now that will allow that air to move in and out. So it's not visual, that's gonna be the bottom of the piece, you won't see it, but it's definitely functional for the process that we're gonna go through. And the punty that they'll make is a very special punty, a blow punty. Um, when we attach a handle to the bottom of the piece, we're gonna attach it to the center of the bottom. So we need a hollow punty and an air channel that will go all the way through. So we'll use a blow pipe for that. But it's common to do that with sculpture. So this, I mean, you could imagine, we could make this barrel out of solid glass, right? But that would be a lot of material. That would be probably 50 pounds of glass or more. So making it out of this bubble, making it appear like it's nice and opaque. And Connor already has the start to that punty. So he took a little gather on that large blowpipe and made a little collar out of it. That's what we call that. It's just a little ring of glass. It does have an opening through it. And now he's taking another gather on there. So this is called a cold core punty. Putting that layer of glass on the inside and letting that layer of glass go totally rigid just gives us some extra material for extra support. And this is really nice for a larger or a heavier object. And here's where he's making sure that we still have an air channel. When you dip that pipe into the furnace, it closes off that air channel. So now he's blowing through that pipe and it creates an opening. Actually just popped a bubble through it, I believe. We did have a question online about some of the hand tools that we work with, and I think it was uh, specifically about the metal tools and how long they will last. Now, the jacks that I like to highlight, these are good for life, um, as long as you use them properly and you don't let them rust considerably. But some of the shears, you know, if you do cut the glass, especially if you cut too cold into the glass, it dulls the blade. Now you can sharpen the blade, you can keep resharpening them if you want, or you can order a new pair it depends on what brand you work with. We have some Jim Moore tools here. We have some cutting edge tools. We have Maruko jacks from Japan. We have some shears and jacks from Carladona over in Murano. And just like any tool, you know, based on the quality that you're after, you're gonna spend the money on it. But personally, I like to take really good care of my tools because I care about their quality and don't want to ruin them. The wooden tools though, they do burn. They burn very slowly, and as long as you don't overuse them or use them improperly, uh, you can really keep them around for a long time. But they do burn, so you have to replace the wooden tools. All right, so this is what Connor's doing. He's working on our punty, and this is that blow punty or a crown punty, it's often called. And he's creating the profile of it, not just so it will attach to the bottom of our barrel, but ultimately we need to make sure that this is gonna support the weight of it, as well as break free when we're done. Uh, so there's a very specific way to get it prepped, making sure we have enough glass to contact and support the weight of this piece, get the shape just right. He'll cool the punty off now. Jeff is maintaining a very important temperature range with that bubble. He's not overheating. He doesn't want to soften or lose the shape at this point, but he needs to make sure that everything stays warm enough. And using that torch one more time to keep that jack line, keep the top of this bubble, the right heat. And then these very brief reheats, these flash heats, just a general overall heat. So now when we go to attach this blow punny, this is where it's critical that we hit very close to center. Because if you don't hit center and you cover up that hole, where you seal that hole, then we've created a problem. 
So Jeff said he's ready now. He's got the right temperature. Connor's got the punny ready. We'll join this. I'm just providing a little back support, keeping the weight of this pipe down. And now Jeff will squeeze in a, another constriction with the jacks. And this is kind of like a jack line for later on. This is where we're ultimately going to break the whole piece free. So preemptively making sure that we can do that. Now we'll let the punty temperature set up. We want that connection to solidify some. And so while we're allowing that punty to turn to the right temperature range, Jeff is keeping the coldest part of the bubble warm with that propane torch. Connor gives the nod of the head, the, the confident nod that he is now ready. He feels that connection is rigid enough to control. Jeff's going to create a little controlled shock. He drips a tiny bit of water onto that constriction. Now that creates tiny stress cracks. Watch this. Just a little tap on that pipe sends a shock through and does the rest. Good. Nice round of applause for that move. Very smoothly done. Excellent. Now, did anybody catch it? Connor, when he had the punny, he sort of ducked down and he blew through it. He was making sure that we had that air path all the way through. So that was why he did that and he said, yep, we're good. Very important. So now this is where we have our opening and most of the blown forms that we work on here at the museum, that's a transfer that we go through almost every single demonstration we do. So if we're making a vase, a pitcher, a bowl, any of these objects, even this roughly top, at one point was on a blowpipe, the opening was small like this. Then you reheat, you re-soften the glass, you can spin it, you can shape it with hand tools and get whatever final result you're looking for. But in this case, we're gonna close that opening off. We're gonna make the top of the barrel. And that's why we needed that air path to the bottom. It's a great barrel shape, Jeff. It's good.
All right, how we doing? Is everybody having fun? All right. Well, welcome to 2300. We have a guest artist, Megan Stelges. How about a big round of applause welcoming Megan to Courtney. She's been here all week. She uh, will work again tomorrow. She's from Arlington, Washington, where she lives and works. And she's going to be featured in an exhibit we have at the museum this summer, The New Glass Now. The New Glass Review um, publication is going to be doing an exhibition on all the artists that were accepted. And Megan is one of those artists. So she'll be, yeah, give her a big round, yeah. So her piece will be in the show, so you're definitely gonna wanna come back to the museum uh, later this spring and check out that New Glass Now exhibit. So we thought it'd be fun to have her come demonstrate and show her process. So Megan does a lot of sculpting. You can see there's some pieces up here in the front. The bananas, the watermelon. The watermelon is something she's been working on. Uh, when you sculpt glass like this and you want to get details, she went to Wegmans, she bought a watermelon, she bought a bunch of bananas, just so we can reference those actual objects. And then it takes a while. It takes a lot of research and development to get the colors right. So she worked with powders, she worked with uh, different types of glass to get the coloration on the watermelon just right. She's, she's got the bananas down, she, she makes those all the time. But she's just now starting these watermelons. And so she wants to make sure that those colors are just right. So she might have to switch out the colors. So we did a lot of, a lot of testing, a lot of um, trial. She was working with um, powders in a way that a lot of uh, glass sculptors do, where she was sifting powder on a kiln shelf and then pushing it around and then melting it to get some, some unique shapes. So like the different striations in the watermelon. She took the powder, she laid it out on a plate and we pushed it around till we got those nice different details like in the watermelon. So that would allow her to create that watermelon rind. And you can see that's over here in this, in this glass watermelon as well. So going with the theme of the wine and cider, she's decided to make a wine barrel with some uh, grape leaves and some grapes. And so right now she's putting together the bunch of grapes. So earlier we made all the little grapes. And in the garage, she's got all those leaves. And the garage is just that oven over there that will keep the glass nice and hot. The tricky thing with working with hot glass, you have to keep everything over a thousand degrees the whole time you're working. And so when you're putting all these pieces together, not only do you have to flash it and keep it hot, but you have to keep all the pieces and parts in an oven as well. They can't get too cold either. So she's bringing those out. G. Brian's got them on a paddle. All the little grapes. And so they're just gonna keep adding these grapes to the bunch till they have a nice big bunch. Same thing with the bananas. Earlier this week she made all the bananas. She made a few extra and then bunched them all together create a bunch of bananas. She uses this hot torch just to, to heat this specific area. For those are, of you who are unfamiliar with our hot glass process, glass is very sticky when it's hot. And so we want to stick two pieces of glass together. They both have to be really hot. So they use the torch and the heat and stick the two together. If you stick them together cold, it's a cold seal and it doesn't stick as well.
Does anybody have any questions? The, when the glass grapes, so right now G. Brian's going into the oven, and those glass grapes are getting hot. Now G. Brian's been working with glass for oh, about 20 years, so he knows if he stays in there too long, they'll all melt into a little puddle. If he stays in there too long, they might start to stick together. So he goes in for these really short flashes to make sure that he doesn't get them too hot. So it's all temperature control, timing and temperature. Yeah. Yeah. So if he stayed in there too long, they'd melt. They'd melt flat. They'd stick together. The purpose of the broom. So on that um, metal plate that G. Brian keeps sticking in and out of the oven, there's a little bit of um, chalk or kiln wash. And so as the as the grapes roll around on that at that uh, plate, it creates a little bit of dust. So the whisk broom will just wipe off any of that dust. If they if they leave that dust on there and go in for that nice good heat, it will. Um, stick to the surface. So we want to keep that nice glass nice and clean so she could just brush it right off. So Megan as a glass sculptor has all these little tricks. We're learning all sorts of new little tricks and she's worked with many glass sculptors over the years. And so she knows all the tricks for sculpting glass. There's, she's got special tools, special shears, techniques. And so we're learning a lot from uh, Megan being here as well. That's the fun thing about working with glass blowers. They all work, they've all learned from different people, they've learned all over the world. And so when you work with different artists, you can learn a lot from their their process. And Megan's learned from some of the very best sculptors there is. The glass fields. So as she's putting these grapes together, Jeff and Chris and Connor have been over there working hard on a the barrel, the wine barrel, which she's going to wrap a vi uh, maybe a vine around. She'll add some straps, she'll add the leaves. So pretty soon, all of this is gonna start getting really exciting and you're gonna see everyone running back and forth, bringing all the different bits and that's where the timing and the temperature and of course, our favorite, the teamwork, will all come together and you'll see this, uh, this process in all its glory. Bunch. Will it make the cut? Now are these purple grapes? A nice purple grape. A nice variety of purple. There we are, a bunch of grapes. The whisking brush, that will just get rid of any dust. So on that little metal sheet, there was a thin layer of um, either chalk or like a kiln wash. And when they roll, yeah, so it doesn't stick. So when the metal gets hot, the glass would want to stick to it. So we put that little bit of resist on there. But as the pieces roll around on that, it does create that little bit of dust, which if you heat it up, will stick right, it will stay there forever. And so she was making a piece earlier, we had a little bit of that dust on there and it melted in. And so she had to use a little Dremel to kind of scratch it off. So the whisk broom is a lot easier and quicker. Yep.
people ask us all the time when we're blowing glass, why don't you wear gloves? And the reason for that is when you're, you know, if you're blowing glass, you need the dexterity of your hands. And if you're playing the piano or typing at a keyboard or playing the guitar with gloves on, it'd be more in the way that it was helpful. But you'll see a lot of glass sculptors, they'll put on gloves. Because she doesn't have to turn the pipe at this point. Connor has got that covered. This is Connor. Connor is uh, Megan's husband. So they've come together and he's helped, he's helped out through the week. He's a uh, glass maker and a cold worker as well. And so he's turning the pipe. He doesn't, she doesn't need to have those gloves on to be able to turn the pipe. And she's holding her hands really close to that big wine barrel that's you know, over a thousand degrees. And so slipping those leather gloves on will just protect her from the heat. So you'll see that a lot of glass sculptors or people who aren't turning the pipe or using, you know, shears and things, you'll see them using, wearing gloves. But for the most part, if you were doing the blowing, you wouldn't, you wouldn't usually wear gloves. So she's got a, a tagliole. She's heating certain areas and carving into the glass with the tag. She also used that little tag when she was carving in the leaves or the veins, the veins of the leaves. And so it's a, a nice tool to get a really nice line in the glass. It's got all sorts of edges. It's got corners, rounded edges. Sometimes the blades are tapered so they make a really nice sharp line. does get hot, so she dips it in the water, cools it right off. So this hot torch, this hand torch, allows her to heat just one specific area. If they were to get the glass hot enough to carve that line inside the reheating oven or the glory hole, the whole thing would be moving around and it would lose its shape. So we use these hand torches to heat up certain areas. Now if she was working on something a little small, you could even use a butter knife. A little butter knife or Glass sculptors tend to have a lot of tools because you cannot touch this material with your hands. You can't use your hands or any flammable materials. And so anything that's not flammable, you could use to shape the glass. Even though she is using the torch, the whole thing does have to be kept hot. So that's why you see him going back and forth uh, Connor has this sort of internal clock that's telling him the glass, we've been out here too long, I'm going to go for a quick flash. Or sometimes you'll hear Megan say, take it for a flash. She is in charge, and so she can tell him to uh, flash or wait or hold, uh, hold it, swing it, whatever she wants him to do. She's in charge, so... Time for any questions while the music's low? Anybody, any other questions? That barrel, I would say maybe about a half an inch, quarter of an inch thick. Somewhere in between there, between a quarter of an inch and a half inch thick. Yeah, it was, if, it was, if it was real thin and she used that torch, it would just kind of ruffle and burn a little hole. So they left it a little thicker so she could do all this carving.
So they're gonna start to use, they're gonna use some powder over here. And when you use glass powders, um, we don't want all that powder getting sucked up into the air. We don't want to breathe the silica dust or the powders. So we have this powder booth that will pull any powder that's in the air um, right back into that filtration system and we'll get rid of the, the dust. So they'll apply all the powders in that powder booth. And they can roll through the powder, they can sift the powder on there. She's even got a wet rag that she's wringing out right now. I've seen her brush the powder off as well. So if there was a certain area. So it looks like they're going to sift a little powder onto the barrel and then maybe brush some of it off. There's a nice close-up view. So sifting it on there will just give her a nice thin coat. They did it a little colder. The glass is a little colder. He didn't go in for a flash, so it won't stick as well. See, she can wipe it right off, leaving the powder just in the, the areas she carved. Pretty neat, huh? Traffic jam at the powder booth. Everyone wants the powder now. So they're going to add some straps to the barrel. And they've chosen a beautiful gold color, which they might reduce. It's a reducing color. So they'll bring some of those metals to the surface. And they'll be nice, shiny metal, I think. Yeah, nice and shiny. Just like the metal straps on the wine barrel. Got some thumbs up up here. They like what's going on. Thank you. How many of you have seen glass pulling before? About half of you. Yep, we've got some glass blowers. How many of you are glass blowers in the crowd? Nice, nice. Yeah, there's a lot of classes going on at the studio, so we've got a lot of glass blowers in Corning. There's always a lot of glass blowers in Corning, but sometimes there's more. Certain times of the year, there's more than others. There she goes, she's gonna wipe off, that's a wet, just a wet washcloth. And because the glass wasn't as hot, it didn't stick, but it kind of sinks down into those little crevices so she can brush the powder right off. So now as they're adding these straps, it looks like Chris has got a strap being, uh, being prepped and ready to go, and Jeff has one as well. So they're, they're making them at the same time, that way they can stick these wraps on at the same time. They don't have to sit and wait for one or the other to apply the color, shape it up, get it hot. So they're prepping things and it's, they're going to be ready to go as soon as Megan's ready to wrap these straps around. So when you're making pieces like this, so if you were to make like a, a, a mug or a vase, you might need just one assistant, but when you're putting stuff together like this that has multiple components and um, 
all these things are happening at once, it's good to have a nice large team. So the, the size of your team depends on what you're making and how much of it you're making. So when they add these straps, if you've never seen glass before, you like this, the hot glass before, you like this because they're gonna stretch it and pull it. You really just get to see how gooey this material is. Chris is flattening that out. This is gonna be one of those metal straps on the barrel, so they want it to pull and stretch out nice and thin, nice and flat. So he's prepping that. So you can see it's in the oven, he's got this kind of lollipop shape. Yeah. You'll hear him talking back and forth. She said, are you ready? They said, yep. She brings it over, she'll stretch it out. Look at this. I love watching that. Nice and gooey. She'll carefully wrap it all the way around the barrel. How cool is that? Very nice. Do it again, they said. Good news, she's gonna do it again. Only one. So now if they didn't have that other bit ready, we'd have to wait for them to apply the color, shape it up, flatten it out, but it's all ready to go. Chris hands it off to Megan. She starts to stretch it out. She's kind of waiting to see the temperature. G. Brian gets in there and cuts off the end. He's ready with the shears and wraps it all the way around. Now that's not the first time she's done that, probably. That went all so smooth. Hey. Yeah, it's starting to look more like a wine barrel now. So those areas she cut free are sharp. Cutting through glass, breaking hot glass, it's just like cold glass, it breaks in a sharp edge. So she's just gonna fire polish. The nice thing about hot glass, it's already hot, so you can take the torch and soften those sharp edges right out. Cleaning up those edges, making sure where the two bits of glass came together are nice and clean. Let's, uh, one of the nice things about a good sculptor is their attention to detail. They make sure everything's nice and clean, everything's cleaned up. Now she's got a little rod of glass that she pulled and she can use that, she can heat that up, heat the end of it up and use that to draw, oh no, it's a copper tube, sorry. It's a copper tube. <laughs> she's gonna use that to press in some little, te some texture. So the copper tube is nice because she can create some little indentation. So if you were making like a little, little animal or something that would be a nice tool to use for the eyes or the nose. So 
she's just creating some like little rivets in the strap. So as they're working on this wine barrel, they're spending more and more time outside the oven. And that punty that's holding the wine barrel on the pipe looked like it was getting a little chilly, so they'll, they'll use that fluffy torch to heat the punty while they're outside the oven. So Megan and Connor have a studio at home um, in a big barn. So they're at, uh, you can find them on the social medias at Gray Barn Studios. So if you want to look up their studio or look up their work, we got Megan Stelges. Um, got some, some uh, Instagram handles here. And then Cold Cuts Glass is uh, Connor's cold working shop. So this would be hot working, and then when you cut and engrave and do the cold working, that's cold glass. So his cold cuts glass. What's that? Originally, she's from Kansas. Kansas, and then moved out to Washington. No? Megan's mom and dad are here tonight. They came from Boston. And, uh, yeah. Corning's a little closer to, uh, or Boston's a little, it's easier to get to Corning from Boston than it is to get from Boston to Washington, maybe. So they drove out, and they're you know, watching Megan work. So she's a little closer. All right, they've got the grapes. They're going to stick this to the barrel. Megan went to art school to learn where to blow glass, how to blow glass, and she went to Emporia State. We've got some other Emporia State alumni. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah? There's the grapes. Look at that. She smushes that right down there. Yeah, so a lot of glass blowers these days are learning the process. Yeah. You can applaud whenever you want. It's like a jet. It's like a, it's like a jazz performance. If you see something you like, don't be afraid to let the team know. Yeah. Once you start to get this far in the process, it starts to feel more, a little more relaxed, but also a little more. You start to feel a little nervous, but she's got everything kind of, it's going smooth. Everything's going according to schedule and according to plan. So she's probably got a little, it's a little less nerve wracking, but maybe a little more because now everything's going to have to start moving a little faster to, to get all the pieces together. So here's the first of the leaves. So you'll see them heat them up, flash them. She's even got to pick them up with some warm tweezers. If she picked them up with cold tweezers, the glass would break right where she picked it up. So it's a, it's a really, what you're seeing is years of experience. She's making this look so easy. Um, and that's just years of experience working with the material. Um, I think if you've ever watched a beginner work or if you've ever tried it yourself, you would know just how difficult this process actually is. But when you see an experienced team work together, it makes it look really, really easy.
So he's heating the punti with that fluffy torch. That's the only thing holding all this artwork on the pipe. Yep. So if that got too cold, we'd actually see it crack, and the whole thing could just pop right off. Yep. Yeah, so we want that to have maybe even a little bit of movement in it. It's on a punty that's called a, it's a sculpture punty, so it's meant to have a little bit of give to it, so it can move a little bit on that punty. Um, if we were making, you know, a traditional vessel or something, we wouldn't want the punty to move as much. But with the sculptural stuff, since she's pushing on the glass and carving into it, we want that punty to have a little give to it. And so it's a nice, big, thick, juicy sculpture punty that they'll actually grind off. So a little bit will be left on the piece um, when they put it away tonight. And then, actually, Connor, he took all, the, all these little pieces on them, had a little bit of glass on the bottom um, that Connor ground off today. And he actually polished it, so I, it's hard to even see where that was. But uh, yeah, they'll, they'll grind it off. You'll also notice, see how he set that down on that metal rail really light? And he didn't kind of just throw it on the, the rail where it would make a noise. That punty connection, although it does have a little give to it, it is temporary. It's meant to come off. And so they'll, he'll be really careful how he sets it down and picks it up while it's on the punty. Chris, yeah. Yeah. So the question was, Chris over here, who has been, he's part of the Corning team, was he ever on the celebrity solstice? Yes, he was, many times for about 10 years. I'll go let him know that you might have seen him. Yeah, we did uh, glass blowing on three celebrity cruise ships for about 10 years. And so, actually, all of us here, we did, we've all done many trips. Chris, we have some uh, guests in the crowd who were on the ship when you were on the ship. Yeah, yeah. Yes, our mission here at the museum is to inspire people to see glass in a new light, and what better way to do that is to travel all over the world on cruise ships, on barges here at the museum. We're live streaming tonight, and so we're hoping to uh, inspire you all to have a new appreciation for this material that we love so much. Questions? Yeah, this is our 2300 event. We do it every third Thursday of the month in the winter. So this is our, our first one. I think our first one got canceled. This is our, our third. Second one. So we'll have a few more going into throughout the winter, so in the, war the cold winter months, you can come warm up with some beverages, some music. Did everyone get into a, a chance to get in to see the, the band? 
So the band, the, what you're, the music you're hearing now, that's in the auditorium. There's a live band in the auditorium. We bring in a new band and a new guest artist every 2300. So it's always a fun time. How's it going, Megan? Are you happy with the piece? What? Happy with the piece so far? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they're going to keep adding these leaves. They might have even turned the glory hole down a little bit because she's got so much detail in these leaves that if it's, if it's too hot, she'll melt out all that detail. So th they might have even turned the oven down a little bit to make sure that they keep all the, the texture in the leaves, the points in the leaves. So now G. Brian with the fluffy torch, he's not only heating the punty, but he's making sure that the leaves stay warm as he's as he's as they're outside here of the as they're outside the oven. Now you could work on a piece of glass all day long if you wanted. As long as you could keep that glass nice and hot, you can work on it. So the second you're not able to keep it hot, it's gonna start popping apart. And so you can work on it as long as you can keep it hot. And cold is around a thousand degrees. At a thousand degrees, it's like a, it's a sort of borderline temperature. We don't want it to fall too far below that. We've got one more leaf and one more small leaf. Yeah, so whenever you get a chance, come check out the work that Megan's made here throughout the week. Yeah, the watermelon, the, the bananas, and over on the table, there's some things to look at as well. To create the, the stripes in the watermelon, she used a technique where she pushed uh, glass powder. So she sifted powder out and kind of pushed it around to kind of mimic the shape. So she brought in a watermelon and bananas to for reference. It's always nice to have the not just to work off sketches or... Yep. Yep, and some of the colors she's been using, her sketchbook. She's even got some little glass watermelon seeds. So she, in the past couple of days, she made some watermelon, and they're on a long cooling cycle, so they're in the oven. Um, they're not out yet. But she put the little seeds on the watermelon. She's got all the little details. Beautiful composition of leaves and grapes. Oh, 
She's also currently um, in. Ex she was uh, last week. She was down in New York at the Heller Gallery. So she has a piece uh, in an exhibit at the Heller Gallery currently. And then I think um, coming up, she's in an exhibit called She Bends. I can't remember where that one was. But she also works with neon. So a lot of her pieces, if you look her up on, um, on the web, you'll see some of her pieces. And a lot of them have neon in them. So she bends the glass tube. So that She Bends exhibit is an exhibit with uh, a female neon glass artists. And so she'll be in that exhibit uh, coming up in the next couple of months, I believe. So she's very busy. She's got exhibitions and gallery presence. Very busy. So you can come see a piece of her work later this summer in our new glass now that will be in the Contemporary Art and Design Wing. So you'll see a lot of new, new pieces in that exhibit. So if you want to start to follow Megan and Connor, we've got some Instagram handles here. We've got Megan's, Connor's, Gray Barn Studios, and Cold Cuts Glass. So you can find them on Instagram, keep up with their work. They're an awesome team. We've, only, we've worked with them for about a week now, but they're very... Very fun to work with. Nice team. So it looks like we're getting close. Chris is putting on his silver suit. That silver suit will allow him to crawl into an oven that's 900 degrees and put this piece away to cool slowly over probably a few days. Piece to side with all these different pieces and parts will slowly cool, not overnight, but over the course of a few days. So Connor said he's going to take a, a quick flash, heat it up, and then he's going to hold it up. So if you want a picture of this piece, this is going to be your last opportunity. So he'll hold it up. You can see it. I, the color is going to change. Right now it's still real hot. So it might look more brown or more orange than it will when it's cool. G. Brian's reducing the straps. So those straps had that reducing color on it. So they're, he's bringing the metals to the surface to give it that shiny, shiny look. All right, they're gonna go for a quick flash and he's gonna show it to the crowd, so, so get ready. This will be your last look. One quick flash just to give everything a quick overall reheat.
All right, there we are. A beautiful wine barrel with grapes and leaves. So now the tricky part of removing the glass from the punty. So this is a tricky part of the process. They're going to get it nice and hot. They're going to get the, the, the little constriction line on the punty nice and hot. They might even cut it off. They might get it so hot that they're able to cut through it. So Chris has got his Kevlar gloves on, face shield, because like I said, he's going to stick his arms and face into the 900 degree oven. So he's got all his personal protective equipment on, his PPE. They use that really hot torch to heat up that connection. You'll notice it'll start to move around a little bit. And instead of adding water or tapping it, they're just going to cut through that hot part. Chris warms the gloves, because believe it or not, grabbing it with cold gloves could crack the glass. So you can, now you can see it's got that movement. It's nice and hot. We'll go in for one more quick flash. Chris gets under it with the gloves. Megan gets in there with the shears, starts to crimp it down. They will add a little water. Looks like they are going to add a little water. A few drops of cold water on that connection will create thermal shock. And into the slow cooling oven, where we can get a closer look. <laughs> Megan Selges, everyone. <laughs> Megan Selges, Connor, Jeff, Chris, G. Brian. We'd like to thank you for visiting the Corning Museum of Glass. Please feel free to come up and ask any questions or check out some of the work a little closer. Definitely follow them on Instagram. And enjoy the rest of your evening here at the Corning Museum of Glass. Thanks for coming.